afternoon. If you are able, please rise for worship. We confess our dependence on the Lord. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Amen. Receive God's greeting of grace. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth. Amen. Let's praise God by responding to his greeting singing Psalm 3, stanza 1 and 2. Peter 2 verse 9 the Lord says to us but you are a chosen race a royal priesthood a holy nation a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light let us proclaim God's excellencies confessing our faith in him as our triune God singing our creed in him one <laughs>
us call on God's name and ask for his blessing to be on us as we worship him and as we hear his word this afternoon. Let's pray. O oh Lord, our God, we praise you for you are king and God and you are worthy of all praise. You are majestic and glorious in your majesty. You are perfect in all the things that you say and all the things that you do. You are holy, holy, holy. And, O oh God, we, your people, proclaim your excellencies, for you have called us out of darkness and into your marvelous light. We praise you. We praise you, our Savior, the light of the world. And, O oh Lord God, you, with your perfect light, have searched us and you know us. Father in heaven, you know us in our deepest need. And you see us in our hidden sin and in our shame. And Father, you have not turned away from us in anger or disgust, but you've turned toward us, you've drawn near to us, even giving your own Son in our flesh to die in our place. You've perfectly met our need in your only begotten Son, and in him, given us the knowledge that is most worth knowing, that we may know you, our God. And Father, you have given us, your people, a treasure that does not fade away or perish or spoil. And Father, for all these good gifts, we thank you, we adore you, and we pray that you would continue to work in us an awareness of who we are, of what you call us to be and to do. Reveal to us this afternoon, also through your word and through the preaching of your word, reveal to us your will concerning our sins, concerning our Savior, and your will also about how we are to thankfully serve you. We pray shed your merciful light upon us, Fill us with the perfect light of your Holy Spirit that we might see and understand that you would work in us an earnest desire, a zeal that is real and lasting to serve you today and every day to do what is right in your eyes. So Lord, we pray, grant us your blessing and hear us in our prayer for Jesus' sake. Amen. I invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to the second letter of Paul to Timothy, 2 Timothy 1 and 2. We'll read portions of these chapters, page 995 in the Book of Praise, or in the Bible, rather. 2 Timothy 1, starting in verse 3. And we'll read into chapter 2, verse 13. To Timothy is the last letter that Paul wrote as he is about to be killed for his witness to Jesus. And in this letter, he encourages Timothy to be a good soldier of Christ, to serve faithfully, and to resist the devil with God's strength. And that connects to our sermon on the last petition of the Lord's Prayer, deliver us from temptation. 2 Timothy 1, starting in verse 3. I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers at night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now, I am sure, dwells in you as well. 
For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. But I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. You are aware that all who are in Asia turned away from me, among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. May the Lord grant mercy to the household of Anisiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. But when he arrived in Rome, he searched for me earnestly and found me. May the Lord grant him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. And you well know all the service he rendered at Ephesus. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. It is the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal. But the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. The saying is trustworthy, for if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. <clears throat> this is God's word. Let us sing before the preaching of God's word of how the Lord equips us and trains us for battle, the spiritual battle that we fight. Psalm 144, stanza 1 and 2.
We come to the last Lord's Day of the Catechism this afternoon, Lord's Day 52. which is continuing to explain the prayer that our Lord taught us. Today we come to the last petition, the last request that we make of God, as well as the doxology and the amen ending. Lord, say 52. What is the sixth petition? And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. That is, In ourselves, we are so weak that we cannot stand even for a moment. Moreover, our sworn enemies, the devil, the world, and our own flesh, do not cease to attack us. Will you, therefore, uphold and strengthen us by the power of your Holy Spirit, so that in this spiritual war, we may not go down to defeat, but always firmly resist our enemies until we finally obtain the complete victory? How do you conclude? your prayer. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. That is, all this we ask of you because as our king, having power over all things, you are both willing and able to give us all that is good. And because not we, but your holy name should so receive all glory forever. What does the word amen mean? Amen means it is true and certain. For God has much more certainly heard my prayer then I feel in my heart that I desire this of him. Loved in Christ, when you're a little child, you can feel pretty helpless at times. Other kids are bigger than you. Some other kids can be bullies. When you're on the schoolyard and getting pushed around again, you can feel quite alone. Maybe you have that memory of your own childhood and growing up. It's in times like those that we look for help. Who's going to fight on your side? And when you're a child, you might appeal to the strongest person you know, your dad. Even though he's not there on the schoolyard with you, you find comfort in his strength. You know he will stick up for you. And so sometimes kids will say that to the big bully. Wait till I tell my dad. He can beat you up because he's strong. My dad's even stronger than your dad. Well, thankfully, we have to endure those days of schoolyard bullies only for a time. But there's a good lesson in how that child appeals to her father. For we have a strong father, beloved, one who cares for us deeply. He will always be our ally in the fight. King David knew this truth. David was a man of war. Remember, his showdown with the Philistine bully Goliath. He also had to defend himself against the jealous attacks of King Saul. And when he was king, David often went to battle. And as often as David went to war, David was victorious. Almost every time he took up sword and shield, that's what happened, he won. Why was he victorious? Well, he chose his allies and his helper as well. But David was resting in no earthly support, not horses and chariots or cruise missiles and attack helicopters. David's sure help was in God. Listen to how he prays in Psalm 35. Praise to God. Contend, O Lord, with those who contend with me. Fight against those who fight against me. He prays for his father to fight his battles. And that's what we pray. Our father is stronger. And he fights with us and for us. And he gives us the victory. Even as we face spiritual enemies, we finish our daily prayer with this cry of certain faith. Heavenly Father, please fight for me. We pray under a constant threat 
for a mighty power and in a confident spirit. We pray under a constant threat. I don't know if you've noticed, but there's a war raging right now. Not the one in Ukraine or Palestine, but closer to home. And we can't help but be involved. We don't have the luxury of choosing to remain at home. We are caught up in the storms of war because there's a battle being fought over us. That was the truth behind the second petition of the Lord's Prayer, the second petition, your kingdom come. That petition is based on the idea that there's this war of two worlds, this battle between the evil prince and the good king. And in God's grand fight against Satan, victories and losses are tallied, they are scored in human souls. They are fighting over us. The Catechism is not exaggerating when it calls this life a spiritual war. That is a theme throughout the Bible. We find it in the Old Testament. Psalm 35, again, David prays, Take hold of shield and buckler. Stand up for my help, O Lord. Draw out the spear and stop those who pursue me. We find it also in the New Testament when Paul says, Ephesians 6, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but our struggle is against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. It's not a matter of choosing whether or not to go to war. Beloved, it's a matter of choosing what side you will fight on. We hear it in Jesus' words in Matthew 12, unavoidably direct. He says, he who is not with me is against me. He who does not gather with me scatters. To stay neutral is impossible. For this is the nature of our war, the Catechism says, our sworn enemies, the devil, the world, and our own flesh, do not cease to attack us. That's an important line in the Catechism, and we need to take it apart for a moment. As God's children, you and I, we have adversaries. Now, what kind of enemies are they? Are they a bit of friendly competition, like the opposing team in Saturday hockey? Are those our enemies? Are they kind of like the schoolyard bullies who harass us for a while and then they lose interest? No, the Catechism says we have enemies that are sworn enemies. Underline that word. That means hatred of a different intensity altogether. Our enemies have a total dedication to our destruction. The devil, the world, our own flesh, kind of like an unholy trinity stacked up against us. The devil, of course, is the mastermind. He's the general in charge of all the battalions of darkness. Daily he plots and schemes and he thinks of new ways for people to commit the same old sins. His temptations are all designed for this one purpose, to draw us away from God, to forget Christ, to ruin the church. That's why James in his letter urges us, resist the devil. Don't make peace with him, but fight continually against his attacks. How long do we really resist the devil's temptations? Sometimes it's only just a moment of hesitation before we give in. And if we always give in to temptation immediately, we actually haven't even begun to feel the power of temptation. Think about that. Temptation has lots in reserve, but we're often so weak that Satan doesn't even need to dial up the pressure on us. You can imagine him saying, these people, they're so easy. They see a provocative image on the screen and they click. A nasty thought occurs to them and they say it out loud at once. They see an easier way and they follow that easier way. 
Beloved, it's only when we don't give in for a moment or two, when we try to stand fast and be holy, that we really begin to feel the pressure of temptation building up. Then we start to understand a little of how bad Satan wants us and how much we need the Father's help. That's one enemy, the devil. Then there's the world, the unbelieving world where you and I live and work. It goes right along with the devil. This world so often serves as the willing vehicle for Satan to deliver his poison right to us. The world plants temptations along the roads that we travel, brings evil right into our homes, sets it before our faces. This is why John, in his first letter, warns us. He says, all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. We live in the world. The battle lines are not across the ocean somewhere that you can watch comfortably on the news, but they're very near. Even if we try to cover up our Christian badge, we are under serious threat. We're swimming against the tide of godlessness constantly. That's why God calls his children, if you're going to live in this world, be vigilant. Think about what you're watching and choosing and doing. Temptations are ever present and not just temptations to do evil. There's a third sworn enemy we have and that's our own sinful flesh. Yes, God is renewing us. We are a new creation in Christ and yet evil still hangs on. That's why we all still find it hard to resist evil. We find it all too easy to neglect the good. You probably learned in catechism class that there's this old distinction between sins of omission and sins of commission. As Christians, we might lead pretty quiet and inoffensive lives. We transgress few of God's commands in a really outward and obvious way. We don't blaspheme, for example. We don't sleep with our neighbor's wife or husband. We don't steal from anyone. But in the meantime, might we be leaving undone good things that God calls us to do? These are temptations that we hardly even notice. But beloved, it's no less a sin to neglect what is righteous. Think about that temptation you have. It doesn't really feel like a temptation, but it is a temptation to look the other way. When your neighbor is right there and you have the opportunity to say something to him about Christ. You're tempted and you give in and you won't say anything. The temptation too to withhold help from a brother in the church. Probably dozens of times per day we are tempted to say, that's not my responsibility. Someone else can do that for a change. It's the wrong time to speak up. I don't feel like this at the moment. Or think of how we are tempted also to leave our Bible unread day after day. Tempted to leave many prayers unprayed. Even in the good things that God calls us to do, we're tempted to take the easy way. This kind of temptation is pretty quiet. It's less of an adrenaline rush than some temptations we face. It's more like a numbness in our hearts. It's this indifference toward God and other people. Because of the weakness of our flesh, we don't even notice that another lukewarm day has passed us by. And so we need to have our radars tuned for the reality that moment by moment we're under attack, sometimes overtly, sometimes quietly. And the Apostle Paul knew about these attacks. Like David, but without ever seeing a battlefield, Paul experienced war intensely and often. 
For instance, when he wrote his second letter to Timothy, he wrote it very much as a soldier in God's army. In fact, he was a soldier behind enemy lines. He'd been captured by those who opposed Christ and put into prison. And though he's about to die for the sake of his Lord, listen to how he encourages Timothy. 2 Timothy 2, verse 3, he says, Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. You're a soldier, he says to Timothy, and you must endure it, implying that hardships will come. The difficulties of spiritual war will spare no one. Not the old Paul, not the young Timothy, not the 60-year-old man, not the 14-year-old girl in the same pew. Whether we are free or imprisoned, healthy or dying, the storms of war will not leave us alone. But, says Paul, let us all endure like good soldiers. What does it take to be a good soldier? A good soldier is someone who knows his weaknesses. A good soldier doesn't underestimate his enemy. A good soldier puts on his armor. Ephesians 6. A good soldier doesn't pretend to be neutral, but she knows very well she either stands on the side of God or the side of darkness. Paul tells us in the next verse, no soldier engaged in warfare gets entangled in civilian pursuits. That's a very revealing comment. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits. A good soldier is focused on the task at hand. When we are entangled every day in all kinds of earthly pleasures and worldly ambitions, we've got all kinds of pursuits, we're not really ready for the present warfare. I'm too busy to fight. I'm too distracted. I'm too burdened to really pay attention to all this. I read a book recently where the author said that the church today needs to get better at practicing what he calls wartime austerity. What is austerity? It's when you ration things, you economize, you simplify so that you can devote more resources to a good cause. Like during World War II, people had to cut back on eating meat and butter and using electricity. Wartime austerity, all for strengthening the cause of the big fight. I wonder if that's how we live. Do we have a real wartime focus? Do we have the kind of simple lifestyle that reflects single-minded devotion to God's kingdom? We don't want to get too entangled in the affairs of this life, not too invested in this godless world, but prepared for battle. Are we ready to devote more of our resources, more of ourselves, to the Lord's cause? For a good soldier's purpose, says Paul, is to please the one who enlisted him. Who enlisted you? On whose side do you fight? Christ, our King, our commanding officer. We listen to him. We're not here to please ourselves, but our priority is to honor Christ by fleeing sin, working for his kingdom. We obey him, knowing that our mighty Father joins us in the battle. So we consider, secondly, that we pray for a mighty power. I'm sure that we've all thought at one moment or another that we're pretty near spiritually invincible. Maybe we haven't said it out loud, but we've acted that way. We've done things or said things like, I can hang out with these friends on Saturday night 
and I'm not going to be tempted to do the things that they're going to do. Or we've said things like, I can get through my days without praying a whole lot. Seems to work out all right. I can watch this bad movie, and it actually doesn't affect me. It has no impact on me, what I see. But see how the catechism calls us out for that pride. It says we have to acknowledge in ourselves we are so weak. We cannot stand even for a moment. We really need the warning of 1 Corinthians 10. Paul says there, if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. Deceiving temptations are nothing new. And it's nothing new that God's children fall. Don't think you're invincible. That you can somehow rise above the godlessness of this world. But make use of God's power. Jesus tells us to pray this every day. Uphold and strengthen us by your Holy Spirit. When we pray to our Father for help, we're seeking an ally who is more than able to assist us. That's what we confess. At the end of the prayer, the doxology of the Lord's Prayer, we say, yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. First, just notice that connecting word for. It's a small word, but it says something essential. We're not just adding the doxology on because we have to. We're giving a last-minute compliment to God. No, for the child of God, praise is not an afterthought, but essential. Those closing words of worship have everything to do with what we've already brought before the Lord. Listen to how the Catechism explains the doxology. It says, all this we ask of you because, as our King, having power over all things, you are both willing and able to give us all that is good. In other words, we say, Father, I know you can truly answer me. In all our troubles, in all our temptations, we know we have come to the right address. Our eyes are wide open as we pray, wide open to the reality of God's greatness, his glory, his utter ability to do all the things we ask of him. And so we pray, Father, yours is the kingdom. It's only a few words, but it's a shorthand way of saying to God, Father, you are a king. From your glorious throne in the heavens, you rule over everything in this universe. And as we have faced the attacks of our enemies, we know that they can do no more than you, Father, allow them to do. God's is the great kingdom. And whenever we say that, we're reminded, too, that we are also part of God's kingdom ourselves. We are citizens of heaven, Paul says somewhere. We have been enlisted into heaven's army. And so we ask that God Almighty would help us to serve him, help us to please him. All this we ask because yours is the kingdom and we belong to it. And yours is the power, we pray. We look to the God of total strength and perfect might. Into our weak human spirit, the Father sends his invincible spirit. As Paul says, God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. God will give you a spirit for standing firm. We can say to him, Father, I'm praying about this temptation and it feels like it has its claws into me, but I know that you can help me deal with it. You're a strong father and I know that you care for me deeply because yours is the power. You can help me to stand. Help me to be holy. 
Help my unbelief. All this I pray, for yours is the power, and yours also the glory. Jesus teaches us to confess that all the credit for your holiness, all the honor for your spiritual growth, all the praise for your faithful service, it's all reserved for God alone. It's his work in you. So give God the glory. In temptation and in trial, we pray to the strong Father who's able to help us. And he will help us. Listen again to what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10. He says, God will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able to bear. And then he adds, with the temptation, God will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Beloved, that is God's sure promise. It's one for you to count on. You will not be able to handle it. But God will. Paul says there is strength available for standing up against the devil. Well, would I ask, does it seem that way to you? Does it seem that there is always a way of escape? Haven't you found some invitations to sin are nearly impossible to turn down? It's like our body will not let us. Or is there a way to stop our mind from doubting? Is there a way to stop our heart from coveting or being jealous? Is there really a way of escape? Some hidden reserve of strength that we just need to tap into? Well, beloved, if God is a God of his word, then there is strength for us. He is faithful. If you are seeking a boost to your self-control, or you need more courage to face your temptations, or new conviction of God's mercy, or wisdom about what to do, these things are freely available. Ask the Father. Seek, knock at his door. We may pray to him in a confident spirit. That's our last point. Well, as many soldiers in many wars have done, Paul sat down to write a final letter home. That's the letter to Timothy. It's a letter that he sends to his younger colleague in ministry. And Paul has a feeling that death is coming. But as the good soldier Paul writes, he knows that his death in God's kingdom is not in vain. He's confident he will receive the reward for work well done. Listen to what Paul writes a bit later in this letter. 2 Timothy 4. He says to Timothy, I am already being poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. That's confidence. God has greatly helped him. God has enabled him to endure hardship as a good soldier of Christ. I have fought the good fight. And so Paul also looks forward. He says in the following verses, verse 8, There is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. Even deep behind enemy lines, Paul has hope. He's certain the battle belongs to the Lord. God will give him the crown of victory. You could say that at the end of his life, Paul gives his amen. He affirms, it's all true and certain, Timothy. God has heard my prayers. God has shown grace in my life, and he'll show grace in my death. Even in my passing away, God will glorify his name. Even when I step into the grave and 
past the grave, God will deliver on his promises to me. Beloved, when we pray, we are allowed to pray with the same kind of certainty. When we endure torment and trouble in this spiritual war, when we deal with the struggles that come with having a weak, sinful heart, we have the same certainty. We can finish our prayers every time with amen. We say, it is true and certain. My Father hears my prayers. My strong Father knows what I'm going through. He will do much more, far above all that I ask or think, according to the power that works in me. He will bring me through this struggle to peace on the other side. We are sure of that. We're not in the same earthly position as Paul. We're not in prison and about to die. But our status before God in Christ is exactly the same. God has claimed us, given us his sign and seal and baptism. God has enlisted us, declared that we belong to him. And so like Paul, we are confident, sure of victory in this war because we know whom we have believed and we are persuaded that our life is secure in him. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, who for us and our salvation came down from heaven. We believe in the Holy Spirit, who is the Lord and the giver of life. This is our God. This is our great ally. If this God is on our side, we don't have to say, I can't do this. I need to give up. No, with God assuring his elective victory, it's never hopeless for us. If Christ is your commanding officer, you as a good soldier have no need to ever feel all alone. No, with Almighty God on your side, you can say, Amen. We pray and we live with confidence in him. Amen. Let's sing from David's war song, Psalm 35, verse 1, 9, and 11.
Let us pray. Our God in heaven, Almighty Lord, we praise you that you are our God and that we may be your people. We may call on you as God and Lord and Father. We may depend on you always. Father, we thank you that you stand near us in our temptations, our struggles with sin, as we wrestle every day with our own weakness, our lack of faith, our lack of holiness. Oh Lord, in ourselves we are so weak that we cannot stand even for a moment. And our sworn enemies, the devil, the world, our own flesh, they do not cease to attack us. Father, as you have promised, please uphold and strengthen us by the power of your Spirit. Help us not go down to defeat, but help us to firmly resist our enemies. We thank you for the confidence that we have as we fight, knowing that if you are with us, there is none that can stand against us. In Christ, you've claimed us as your own. With this confidence, encourage us then, each one, to be good soldiers, faithful to the one who enlisted us, not entangled in civilian affairs, but focused on what you call us to do and who you call us to be. Give us strength, Father, for you know we need it. Give us wisdom and bless us with courage. Lord, we pray for your church in those countries where there is outright persecution. Father, there are many places where your people are being imprisoned, being oppressed, where they are even dying. Lord, we think of your church in China. We think of your church in so many Muslim countries in the Middle East. We pray, give encouragement through your word and spirit. Help them to stand fast and to fight the good fight. We pray for ourselves too. Father, we pray for our churches here in Canada that you would give faithfulness and preservation, that you would give your people the ability to resist the devil's temptation, the many things that he's trying to sell us and persuade us of. Help us, O oh Lord, to be wise with your wisdom and to be faithful to you. Gracious Father, we thank you for the work of reformed education. We think especially of the work that's being done right now to move to the new Guido location. And Father, we pray that you would bless this. Bless the cleaning that is done and the moving and the preparation. Father, we pray that you would make all things go well, that after a Christmas break, classes may resume again. Father, we pray for the students, we pray for the teachers at Guido and at the elementary schools locally, that you would bless them in the remaining days of this school year, the calendar year, or to give joy in the work, give strength and good health. Continue to build your church also through reformed education. Father, we pray also for the churches in our federation that remain vacant. Father, we pray for this congregation also, that they might find a minister soon. We pray too for you to work in the hearts of more men, that they would be found eager to take up the work of ministry and the work of mission. Father, we lay these things before you, acknowledging our own weakness, our own inability. But we pray these things to you because we know that yours is the kingdom and yours is the power and the glory forever because as our king you do have power over all things and you are both willing and able to give us what is good and so for jesus sake we pray all this we ask that you would please hear us in his name amen
We'll now worship God with the giving of our gifts, and after the offering, we'll sing hymn 78, stanzas 1, 3, and 5.
receive God's blessing. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.